Hello innovators, I'm Dustin Miller, Poly Innovator. Today I'm talking with Alex Weber, the antidisciplinary architect, a multifaceted creatorpreneur, coach, and content creator. Thank you for joining me on the Polymath Polycast. No problem, man. It's great to be here. Even if you have a desire to become a certain type of person, you need to have a self-development system that is going to hypothetically generate that result. And so I understand that when someone hears architect, they think building, right? But it actually, when you look it up, it really just means connector of independent system. If, it, if you know anyone who's an architect or if you've been in it before, once you get into school, it's, it's up there with law and medicine in terms of the, the journey that it takes to even make it through. So. Dustin Miller, Polly Innovator. Innovators crave innovative products, which is exactly why the Polymath Polycast is powered by Riverside.fm. And I know we had a chat, I think, last week about just kind of both of our lives and the things we're interested in that definitely helped at preparing some of these questions here. I'm glad to get be able to talk to you on the show, on the record. The way I like to break the ice is to have you share something about yourself that no one knows about you. Sure. Yeah. I always have this one ready to go. I was in the circus for a couple of years, actually, when I was a kid. So, yeah, that was I had a ton of energy and my parents were always looking for ways for me to get that out so that I didn't drive me crazy. So yeah, I was, I was in that and I loved it. I loved doing that gymnastics, all sorts of uh, weird things like riding unicycles and stuff like that. So yeah, it's a fun definitely one. takes a lot of coordination too. It does. Yeah. You kind of have to, um, yeah, you just got to roll with things and just be able, willing to try something and maybe fall mm -hmm. down and do something scary. So, but I always liked it. Yeah. I love how that also kind of translates to lessons you can learn for later on in life too. Like sometimes you're going to fall off, but you got to get back up. A hundred percent. Yeah. There's no way you're hopping on a unicycle all the first time and that thing's going forward. You know, it's hard yeah. to do a, a regular bicycle, but um, exactly. yeah, it definitely has served me well. That's awesome. Uh, so given that's kind of how you were as a child too, let's kind of skip forward a little bit. How, what was your mindset five years ago and how have you changed since then? Yeah. I honestly think I'm pretty similar. I just think everything's better, right? I mm -hmm. think I'm more experienced, more resilient, uh, more patient, more presence. I think more presence is maybe the biggest thing, right? Because mm -hmm. there's a lot of nuance with what it means to be present and how to carry that out in your life. But I think mindset wise, everything's going, always been going in this this direction, right? And I hope to say the same thing another five years from now. like. I don't think that I'm going to be any different personally, right? I just think I'm going to be better, right? So that's the way I look at it. Yeah, I actually started my whole personal brand because I wanted to get better. I knew that I wasn't where I needed to be personally in order to accomplish my goal. So I spent the next five years pursuing that. And here we are doing this. So I think you might understand that too, considering your branding that you do. Yep. It's interesting to think about like what we're trying to accomplish. So what do you think you've been trying to work on and what you feel successful at? Right. It's very, very interconnected, kind of what you just said, right? Like, I think that self-development in a vacuum mm. is, it's not bad or it's not good, right? I think, but when you have a project or something that is propelling you forward, push, pushing your yourself out of these boundaries and whatnot, like you kind of almost have to have an outlet for your self-development, right? I think that it's very hard yeah. to constantly be pushing yourself when you're not when you're just doing it for the sake of doing it right mm -hmm. but um things i've been working on are my time management but not in the typical way that that would be discussed right and uh this probably will be stuff that we discuss today right because mm -hmm. of the way that we look at our lives and creators whether you consider yourself a polymath or anti-disciplinarian or generalist or whatever the concept of how we use time and then how we feel about that and experience our life as a result of that is very different from someone who is oriented to time blocking and mm -hmm. is more in a typical like specialization within a field. Right. And so I've been working on, I mean, what is going to make my business perform? Right. And that's ultimately the measuring stick. But within that, like, do I feel good as a human being about the actions that it takes to produce that result? Right. And I noticed as I got going from leaving the professional world as an employee to becoming an entrepreneur that, you know, you are in charge and you're responsible for that lifestyle that you create mm -hmm. right? and you can have a lifestyle that you like and it could produce no results. So you're not going to be successful, but you also could be super successful, but 
the actions that it takes to make that result happen and to live that life, you could absolutely hate, right? So, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of, you know, striking out on your own and being independent. So I've really been just trying to nail down what that sweet spot is where I'm getting up every day. I, some days I'm super excited to take the actions I need to. Some days I'm not at all, but the actions mm -hmm. are taken at a, a base level. Right. And I know that that's going to drive performance in the long run. And yeah. I'm just going to bank on the fact that as I adopt these, these principles and these lifestyle habits in, and I, I start to experience the results that I'm going to like it. And if I don't, then it's my, my accountability that needs to make the changes, not someone else's. There's a lot of points you made there that we could jump off of. Cause I definitely think that people who are multidisciplinary or anti-disciplinary, they have this kind of need for time blocking, but there also is the kind of point of should you time block or should you just manage your time in a more efficient way? And something you kind of mentioned there is like, you may not get it done at the right time, but you're going to get it done no matter what. And that's something that's really important. Like it doesn't have to necessarily be quote unquote on time as long as you get it done and get that goal moving. Because we have two points. You have like us in the middle, you have the projects that are pushing you forward and that North Star pulling you forward. Mm. And sometimes it's either a push or a pull, but as long as you're moving, that's what matters. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and you literally can feel like sometimes you are being pulled in different mm -hmm. directions or very strongly in a certain direction, but maybe another part of your psyche or whatnot is, it, it's just, it's very, very difficult, I think, to get all arrows pointing in a singular direction and then to pull that yeah. off every single day, right? Uh, to varying degrees and kind of feel satisfied. Uh, but yeah. that's the challenge of this all. If it was easy, then like everyone would be doing it, of course. <laughs> everyone would be doing it, yeah. So from a young age, you were interested in architecture. What was your drive to learn that? Yeah, man, it's so many different things, but I write about this, I've uh, written about this in recent content and also on my website. You know, I'll talk to certain friends or whatever. And I think I, for a long time, I took for granted how singularly focused I was on that being my thing. Whereas I think a lot of people, I mean, they enter college, they choose majors that they don't even know, they just want to get into college, right? They're not mm -hmm. even worried about where that's going to take them. And for me, I kind of always knew that there was this thing there. But then as I got later on in, in life, I started to look back and like, well, why why did I make these choices? Why did I end up in this position? And I mean, there's there's a lot of evidence there to, to get insight into it. But I mean, one thing was I was always drawing. Uh, I had older sisters, but they were so much older than me that they were already out the house. So I was essentially an only child. And mm -hmm. uh, my father passed away when I was 12. So what happened was I ended up spending a lot of time alone in my early teens and, uh, you know, obviously leading up to going to college. And so imagination became something that fueled my ability to make it through time. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I had friends and everything, but I mean, I spent a long, long periods of time alone and I ended up reading a lot and getting into other kind of creative activities because of that really to fill the time. Uh, so drawing, I love making origami. I like doing things that were kind of in the, at the intersection of making, but also had some sort of scientific or maybe mathematical element to them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and one of the really cool stories that I have that's related to this is in sixth grade, one of our teachers, she had us write a letter to our future self. And so mm -hmm. you would write this letter and then you'd hand it in and then she'd actually mail it to you seven years later when you're a senior in high school, which is really cool. And so when I got mine, I read through it and there was some, you know, just generic stuff like these are the people I hang out with. These are my friends. But it was cool because I said in there, I love drawing floor plans. I want to be an architect when I grow up. And it just kind of provided a little bit of a, a narrative there to to go off of, right? And I'd already, I always had that in the back of my mind, you know, I'm from Illinois, like a smaller city. And so when I got a chance to visit Chicago when I was a kid, Chicago was one of the great architectural cities in the world. And uh, it's where Frank Lloyd Wright's from, who's a very famous architect that I think even most people who aren't really even that familiar with architecture still would probably know that name. And so I was just kind of absorbed in that world of like buildings and design and the, the energy that wow. a city gives you. I thought that was very inspiring. So kind of all these forces came together and, but 
in terms of action, it was the little things. It was drawing all the time. It was in high school enrolling in a vocational program, which taught you the fundamentals of computer aided drafting, which is going to be an essential if you're going to actually do it right. Mm -hmm. Drawing in your sketchbook is one thing, but you know, doing the work is is another thing. So that got got me ready for that and made me consider going into it in college. So there's a lot of different things. And then from college, it's a whole other leg of the story because if, if you know anyone who's an architect or if you've been in it before, once you get into school, it's it's up there with law and medicine in terms of the the journey that it takes to even make it through. So, mm-hmm. well, because considering how important buildings are in society and being, making sure that everything's actually like up to code and up to yeah. snuff, yeah. make sure nothing like collapses, obviously. Well, and I love how there was a lot of connecting dots too. Just even from a young age, it kind of jumped around, but it was one of those things where it was that consistency layer. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. I resonate with that. I kind of said something similar about being a businessman when I was around the same age and then eventually CEO and like all this different stuff, just continuing over to life. So I resonate with that whole mindset, like even from a young age, connecting those dots. Yep. Something you came up with is what the adapt growth system. So could you explain that a little bit? Yes. It's still in a, a state of evolution, but I would say it characterizes my own personal perspective toward holistic self-development and creative development as an individual. I think that there's always a constant feedback loop that's happening between our development as individuals and as human beings and our creative capacity to develop something, whether it's just literally for the sake of creating something or if it's literally to create it in, to make it to be a a vehicle for our business and to fuel our lifestyle, right? And I think that when I, when I look out in the market, generally I see less holistic solutions than more holistic solutions. You know, maybe people will focus on a very specific piece of self-development, which could be something like presence work or meditation or something like that. Those are components of self-development and growth, right? But it's, mm-hmm. you know, once you start practicing it, you see how that indirectly influences creativity, right? And then you could have stuff like creativity development or business development, which would be like maybe learning sales or marketing or learning how to draw or, um, you know, creating content, you know, these are creative actions, right? And by taking those actions, you actually, you know, create your own growth, right? Through that. And so there's always this feedback loop that's operating. And what I wanted to do is get right in the middle of that process and really explore the intersection between the two as opposed to focusing on one specifically like self-development or even zooming in further to niching in a specific subject in a self-development domain or creative domain or business domain. I'm more interested in how do all those pieces come together, Mm -hmm. you, the individual, and you make a lifestyle out of that so that as your self-development is going up, your creative development is going up at the same time. I love that too. I haven't talked about the hourglass analogy where you kind of compound going up, you start adding more and more little pieces, but the same thing can kind of go the other way around too. If you kind of lose one thing, you might lose the other thing and starts going down. But what you're kind of saying there is like, you have those different components. And while once you're used to it, you could probably manage multiple different plates spinning around. At first, you got to work on that one little bit and keep mm-hmm. on the momentum. Just, just like riding a bike or a unicycle, you got to keep the momentum going. And then you can start getting better and better and going farther and farther, doing more components. Yes, exactly. Yep. Does that lead kind of into the whole creatorpreneur mindset? I think so. I believe so, right? And that term is... I consider it an emergent term, right? It's, I don't think something that even five years ago, there's a guy, uh, I think his name is Ali Abdal. Um, yeah. but he's, you know, well known for kind of using that term and I'm just, I'm co-opting the term or whatever. I don't really believe in this idea of like, oh, this is my term or that term. Like I'll steal from anyone, you know, and make mm-hmm. it my own. Um, but he's, he's talked about that concept a lot and it raises some really in- important questions of, about you, the creator or the entrepreneur out there, if you aspire to be that, or if you're already doing it right. And for me, like the way I think about myself and my journey is I was a creator first. Like I learned how to become an architect to design, yeah, exactly. To design buildings, to, you know, that, that was my realm is the creative realm. But I did, like you said, I mean, you saw yourself even as a, at a young age, like I see myself as a CEO, as a business person. 
though that wasn't the, the, I would say the dominant thing that I was thinking when I was younger, I always knew that there was a side of me that wanted to explore that domain as well, but it would have had to have been through the lens of my own creative expression. Whereas I think some people, they are entrepreneurs, they are business oriented, or maybe their, their primary domain is something like sales or marketing or fulfillment, which is right. right? We need all these things. And then maybe if they're a solopreneur, if they work in a team, it's more about learning how to leverage whatever creative abilities they have to fuel that the more dominant expression of what they do well, right? And so maybe that would be an entrepreneur who's creative versus a creator who becomes an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. But I think one of the int most interesting things is like, I think the word creator it can be as specific or as broad as you want it to be, right? And the, the broadest level, I think it's just about making things through your own self-expression and then finding a way to exchange those with other people for value, right? Um, but I guess in the most more specific thing, if you wanted to tribalize it, you know, maybe it's like painting and drawing and UI, UX design. These are creative things. And you know, sales and marketing or not, but I just, I don't, I don't think I see it that way. Right. I think that there's creativity that can be expressed in any domain. Right. And it's just a matter of kind of how you apply that. So I think right now I'm just using it as a way to gauge how other people see themselves out in the market and see yeah. if it becomes an attractant force. And so far it has, I think I've had a lot of people reach out and be like, I love you using that word or whatever. And so I'm just, I'm kind of rolling with it right now. I see other people who like one guy connected with, he calls himself the fatherpreneur and he, he has his own business, but he's also been teaching his daughter from a very young age, how to, you know, think business, right. Think how to manage my money. And I love that. Right. So I think to some degree, these labels are also just marketing terms to be able to attract certain types of people to you. So, yeah. I definitely like creatorpreneur mindset. Solopreneur is the one I kind of anchor to a little bit, but it's pretty okay. similar in nature, just a bit more like business, I guess, centric. Sure. And funny story, Alex, uh, Dr. Adal actually came on the podcast a while back. So it's really? kind of fun. Right before really? he hit 1 million subs, I think. Yeah. Well, in the creatorpreneur mindset, especially since you and I both started out as creators first, we had that creativity kind of innate in us, blogging or videos or whatever we might end up doing. It's just one of those things where it's fun to make that content. It's helpful. We're talking about stuff that people might not always talk about, like interdisciplinary and, or polymath and stuff like that. And so we're filling that kind of quote unquote niche or meta niche that needed to have somebody there. But being a coming, uh, but becoming a creatorpreneur, adding things like courses or books or stuff you can actually sell or maybe some kind of you know downloadable PDF, those kind of things are always a really way to nice way to upgrade that kind of free content to something else. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Where do you see the future of being a creator going? That's a, that is a, I think a great question. And I think that, that that would have so many different interpretations, but for me, especially probably for people like us, I think that I'm betting that the next five to 10 years are for people that are multifaceted, right? That mm. generalist is going to, become the dominant, I guess, innovator as opposed to the specialist, right? That's just a broad statement, right? Well, what I'm, what do I mean by that? I and mean, I think it's that, you know, there's a lot of people that have written about this, but as society's acceleration of change has gone up, right? The technology has gone up. It's outpaced our ability to even keep up with it, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's only that rate of change is only going to continue. And so I think that problem solving today is approaching it from a disciplinary or a unidimensional standpoint is not only is it ineffective, but it's almost like inhumane to some degree. Like it's not going to be effective in solving mm -hmm. these problems, right? I mean, I think COVID presented such a, you know, of course there's different ways to dissect it, but just looking at it as a problem to solve, it was such a, it was a global problem and it was a problem that had to be addressed holistically from so many different standpoints, politics, design, innovation, workforce, you know, everything has changed as a result of that. And I think it's just a really interesting thing to just observe right outside of being also a part of that experience and commenting on that is like, I think that showed 
the ineffectiveness of certain 20th century mindsets, 20th century systems, 20th century standard operating procedures for, hey, this is how we effectively operate in a crisis and this and that or whatever. I think it exposed a lot of the issues when there's breakdowns in communication and, and um, conceptualization between domains, right? Where, hey, this is our space, you know, this is what we know. So don't tell us what you know or whatever. And I think that the future, if we're going to survive and thrive, is going to need less of that and more interoperability, right? Right. And so that means if you break that down from the highest level of the fractal to the individual, that means that we need more individuals who are interoperable, almost as like developing yourself as like your own, I'm an API, right? Like you can plug me in to different situations and I might perform differently within that role, but I'm still a self-sovereign individual, right? Yeah. But I think the world needs more of that and less just disciplinary specialists even though they will still always have a role, there will be a position for that. I think that the world is going to need more of that because the problems are too complex for you to bring a disciplinary specialization and think that you're going to be an effective problem solver, either as an individual or as a team. And so I think from a self-development and also an entrepreneurial standpoint, my goal is to find a way to help people develop themselves into these characters, right? Because the modern education system is not designed to do that at all. And so that's why we need alternative forms of education and self-development because people are going to need to step up to be able to fill the shoes that are going to solve those problems in the future. Well, and we have so many different domains that need to be taken care of. The whole supply chain actually just kind of ruptured after the whole quarantine yeah. kind of thing. And it's amazing how there's still effects that we're feeling today, the impact of all that. And while some specialists might be, okay, they're experts of those domains, the systems kind of relate them those domains together. The generalists will be the ones that help bridge that kind of thing more. We saw the weak links in those systems and a generalist will be able to fill in and fix those fix or replace those broken links, if you will. Yes, exactly. Yep. There's a creator named Dan Ko who talked about like the digital renaissance. And there's a few other people who are talking about it too. A guy named Till Mosoff or something like that. And I've, I've tried to talk about it a little bit on my stuff as well, because it's just interesting how the Web3 renaissance, whatever you want to call it, this new digital age, there's a lot of people who are adapting to it. And those people are generalists. This is our new environment. It may be digital environment, but it's still our new environment for our species and people who are able to adapt to it, adapt to AI, adapt to the new changes in technology and ways of learning, modalities of learning. Those are the people who are going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love Dan Coe. He's been very inspirational to me. And um, yeah, he just put those guys, uh, the guys that are on that level, they provide such a great blueprint and also at the same time, I love it because I don't think that they like advocate for a blueprint. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and I, I try to take the same approach, right? Because I think about when I'm working with people, like, I think it's very easy to get just, hey, just follow what I'm doing or whatever. But that approach is like almost part of the problem, right? So you have to stop yourself and really even become self aware. It's like, I mean, I think providing templates and blueprints and showing people hey, this is a way forward if you're like this kind of person, but you're literally not going to walk in each of my shoes and be happy as an individual because you're not, you should, you're not me and I'm not you, right? And so right. I love those guys because they're showing the way, but they're also advocating for figure it out yourself to, to a varying degrees, right? And I, think, I was about to say like, as, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. As I was, uh, I was about to say, like considering that we're coaches, we give blueprints to our clients, but we definitely have to encourage exploring your own pathway and going beyond just a blueprint. Yes, I, I notice it. I think, and I've been writing about it a lot in my LinkedIn content, just even the last week, a uh, couple weeks, is like, you know, I, I, I understand the power of templates a hundred percent, and I, I don't disagree with like people using them and advocating for putting it out there, but. I notice from the other end, from the up and coming entrepreneur or creatorpreneur or just creative, right? Uh, because right. I've been coaching programs where I'm a student, right? And I get to listen to other people who are in the same space talk and I hear what the problems are and it's easier to see as an objective outsider. Like, I think that when you take people's autonomy of 
them figuring out creatively how to express themselves authentically when you just give them the way to do it right it it's like you're just creating a new version of the problem that they're coming from right which is like here just do it this way or whatever and that might work for them in the short term get the result faster but that's my whole problem with results over process mindset is we promote it as coaches because we want to sell a transformation right and so then from the consumer standpoint, you come in with a results oriented mindset, which there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, yeah, you, you want to know what results you want, but it creates a corruption with enjoy learning how to enjoy and also how to de derive like pleasure and dopamine from micro wins in the process. Right. And I've experienced it myself to be able to even speak about this. And I really think that there's a corruption there with our, just, I don't know. I, I need to unpack it more to be honest with you, but it's like we have a results mindset and the systems we use and the conventions we use to sell, it further reinforces that mindset. And so then when people come in, they're not about developing their own process. They just want to use someone else's process to get to where they want to go as fast as possible. And then they get there and they can't enjoy it and they don't know how to actually make it their own. So they're always going to be dependent on a template or a system instead of figuring out how to create their own right for themselves. They got to be able to immerse themselves more. And it makes me, before I get to the next question too, it makes me think about like swim lessons. I always tell my students, mm -hmm. it's not about getting from point A to point B. It's how you get there. Like mm -hmm. the whole Dallas th idea of like the journey kind of thing too. It's about how you get there because what you do in that moment is how you're going to learn, how you're going to process how, what you do when you're getting panicky in the brain, that kind of thing, that journey part of it. Yes. Yep. Well, so you introduced the whole idea of this antidisciplinary mindset to me, and you talked about the person who introduced it to you a while back during our previous chats. While multidisciplinary is having multiple nodes, interdisciplinary is the intersection between those nodes, these antidisciplinary mindset is the space in between them. So what made you hooked onto that latter term? Mm -hmm. A number of different things, but I think one thing that jumps out to me, um, and you talk about this, I think in your your branding as well, is like, I think the idea of a polymath is almost like an end state, right? Even going back to what we just talked about, results versus process, it might be the culmination of, of a career or a life, right? But as the individual living out your life in the present, performing the actions, even if you have a desire to become a certain type of person, you need to have a self-development system that is going to hypothetically generate that result. And what I liked about the antidisciplinary concept was that it was a way of working and thinking and being and almost organizing your life versus when I think about trying to become a polymath. So if I'm going to like try and recreate what Leonardo da Vinci did or something, it was very difficult to, you know, do that from that term, right? You almost have to reverse engineer it. So I, I see them almost as complementary terms, right? I see like anti-disciplinary being the process oriented mindset of an individual who wants to holistically self-develop themselves and become an independent creator and to not pigeonhole themselves along the way. Right. right. And by living a lifestyle out through that methodology and that mindset, that person could become known as a polymath one day, but I don't think about polymath necessarily as at least the way that the term is used now as process oriented, unless you were to create, you know, like you have like an educational system potentially that helps you start to think that way and starts to help you be that way, develop yourself that way. So I like, again, I think it's an extension of a process over results mindset for me. Right. But I think that the term really it's untapped in terms of its potential, right? I think there's a few people that have really talked about it in some very high level academic writing, but I don't think it's been really brought out into the mainstream and um, marketed as a way to be able to develop yourself as uh, an alternative to more disciplinary specialization type roles. So that that's generally my interest in it is it provides me with that way of thinking about how I'm developing myself versus who do I need to become, you know, someday so that people see me as this type of figure. I think it's very hard mm -hmm. to live life that way, 
even though I do have those kinds of goals, I think to bring myself back to the present, I need something that works for me almost as like a mantra to some degree. That's how multidisciplinary is for me. So I get that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure a lot of people watching in you technically kind of skipped to my next question there. I'm not normally very linear with the questions, but the one thing I was going to ask is what is a polymath to you? And you kind of yeah. already explained that you beat me mm -hmm. to it. <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's a lot more. And I think that it was a term along with Renaissance man that I even remember being drawn to when I was younger. I, I always was drawn to that idea. And I thought about that consciously, even as I was growing up through high school, through college, and even into my professional career. And I've made conscious decisions like along those lines, when other people went, the, I'm going to go all in this way. I, I, I'm always zagging when other people are zigging. Right. Mm -hmm. And like an example of that, when I started jujitsu at a school out in Boston, before I moved back home to Illinois was, it was an awesome school, but they had jujitsu was the dominant martial art that, that was taught there, but they also had Muay Thai, they had wrestling, they had judo. And so when I went in, right, I wanted to get a sample of everything. Mm. Most people just find one thing that they think they're going to be good at or that they really like, and they just only do that. And there's definitely like a, there's a method to that, to that process, right? You're going to get really good at that thing. But me being antidisciplinary, I was like, no, I have to try everything at least if, and then if I want to choose something cool, I'll do it. But what I ended up doing for those two years was, I did more of like maybe like a 60% jujitsu, you know, 30% Muay Thai, maybe 10% of the others. And I found that by doing that over time, what happened was I got more holistically better than, that's not a term, but more holistically better than a lot of other people who could beat me potentially in one specific domain, but in in a fight, right? If you're going to develop yourself, that's the whole point of MMA, right? Is that it's a blending of, of the arts or whatever. And so if you're only good at one thing, if you, if someone else has that thing, uh, the thing that's the antidote that then you have no backup plan, you have no other yeah. way to respond. And so I thought it was a great primal way to explore the ideas. Like, look, like I'd rather be not as good at anyone in one thing, but if I can be holistically better than a majority of people, I'll always be competitive. And to some degree, what I notice is that you start to have a mental edge on other people because you're going to go, you're going to go through more suffering by doing this process. But my whole life, I've taken that approach that the more suffering I take on voluntarily, the long term, I'm going to suffer a lot less than other people. And that gave me insight that I was correct, at least in that one specific experiment in life. It's like I went through the pain of getting smashed in all of those disciplines by people that were better than me. And then over time, as I started to meld the disciplines together, I started to started to turn the tables on it. And it's, it showed me that, no, there's this there's an approach to this, but it's the whole delayed gratification approach. Right. If you want to get really good at one thing, and get known for that, you can do that. You can do that very quickly. Right. But if you want to play the long term game, you're going to need to kind of like be OK with being less well known up front. You're going to confuse more people that are not going to understand why you're doing this the way that you're doing it. And you just have to believe in yourself and what you're doing in your process that, hey, whatever, it's cool. This is how I'm doing things. This is how my I'm betting on my future this way. And mm -hmm. I guess we'll see where the chips stack up in the end, right? That's always been my mindset. Well, and not to make a reference to the circus life, but you're, you were good at juggling many different things. And that's one path I talk about. Like you have the serialized where you're focusing on one thing right after the other or the juggling path. And it's pretty much mm. one or the other. But the juggling path is something that some people just naturally gravitate towards. I think a lot of multi-potentialites are more jugglers than even generalists. Some generalists are actually more serialized than people think. But mm -hmm. one thing I reminds me of is like Bruce Lee, who yes. I consider a polymath, but in this context, he is a hyper specialist. He focused more on doing things over and over again. So he's, he has a quote that's pretty famous where it's like, I'd, I'd be more scared of someone who practiced the same kick a thousand times or 2000 times than someone who practiced a thousand kicks or 10,000 kicks at once. And while 
sure in his context that hyper specialization led him to be fast, right? Like you can kick really fast and you can have that kind of power and speed. In your case, the opposite way, being someone who mastered so many different kicks, you're able to adapt to different situations. And so when something calls for it, you're able to actually do that. Yes. And you bring up another phenomenal point, though, that is kind of lost in the weeds is like, you can be disciplinary within a, an anti-disciplinary or multi-potentialite meta strategy, right? For yourself. Mm. And so I, I subscribe to what you just said about um, Bruce Lee. In the beginning, you might want to experiment with a number of different things to really understand the game, right? But then within that strategy, right? What I ended up doing, for example, with jujitsu is I took one technique, which was the dominant technique that I used to submit people to get the tap essentially, right? And it was built around my specific attributes as an athlete, right? Which is my length and my flexibility, right? I was just having a conversation about this with a guy at the gym the other night. We were talking about it, but he's a big, big built dude. And I said, you know, if, we're, if we were fighting, it would be almost pointless for me to fight you with your, like, your strength, right? Trying to fight your force with my force because I'm never going to win that, right? But if I can get you into a certain position and all of my moves are to funnel you into that position – then I know more than likely I have an 80% chance that I'm going to finish you, right? Because you're not ready for that. And it's, so I, I got really good at one technique, but it was after about a year of just doing broad stuff and not really gaining any traction anywhere. And that's where you have to trust in the process. But then yeah. when you find that thing, then like Bruce Lee, get become the best in that one thing, but have a holistic strategy that funnels people to that one thing. Have you read the book Range? I have not. But it's actually I just finally came across that a couple of days ago in my research. Uh, by is it Epstein or something? Epstein, like that? Yes. Yeah. David Epstein wrote this book, and I think it's like an introduction or one of the early chapters. He talks about uh, Roger Federer and Tiger mm. Woods. Tiger Woods was a specialist from the youngest age, from like literally toddler doing golf and get really good at that. He was a hyper specialist. And while he got really good at it, and that's was like his main thing, that deliberate practice was very focused and nuanced. And there were still kind of some things where he might be better. Maybe he was a better basketball player, but we'll never know because he was so narrowly minded there. Whereas mm -hmm. Roger Fer Federer, and part of that was also his dad too, but Federer, on the other hand, tried a whole bunch of different sports, like a dozen different sports growing up. And he's known as one of the world's best tennis players. But that's because he eventually found that one after dabbling and experimenting as much as he wanted to and playing around with maybe wrestling or something like that. And eventually found that one he liked and just doubled down, tripled down on that one. And that's why he got good at it because he found the one mm -hmm. he enjoyed doing and focusing on. Yeah, that's interesting. You hear about like basketball players that are coming out today who – are phenomenal because the footwork that they learned playing soccer, you know, but then they grew like inches in a year, but they brought all of the, the ability that comes with typically a smaller player, but now they're in a, a frame of someone who's usually like a lumbering kind of unskilled person. So they're, they're able to, to blend all of that. And yeah, it just seems to be the way that you see, you see it in every domain, like you see it in athletes, you see it in tech, tech, um, you know, design, I think that it's just a natural con convergence culture that's emerged, you know, since the, you know, the previous century and all the way into now. And it's kind of hard to perceive it, right? But then, of course, when you look back, you see the massive changes in the way that people develop themselves. And the skill level is just so much higher, right, because of the way, the different ways that people choose to develop themselves and the unique circumstances mm -hmm. that their lives present that they that end up becoming like formative elements of who they become, you know, like you said, like Tiger Woods' dad, right? That's not Tiger himself, but it obviously shaped a lot of who he became and how he, his mindset and approached everything. Well, and you said something earlier about the antidisciplinary mindset and it sparked a really cool idea, but I think I lost it at the moment. So if it comes back, I'll let you know. Sure. It kind of did make me think about the creatorpreneur mindset and how different nodes are different content types. You have podcasts and videos and blog posts. Mm -hmm. And while the disciplinary mindset might be the focus on one node, the multidisciplinary mindset, which is something I more employ, is like focusing on multiple nodes. I'd rather you make a hundred posts, whether it's a blog post, video, and podcast, like you can mix between them. So it's 30, 30, 30 if you wanted to, or some people like to focus on just one, 100%. 
But then you also have the antidisciplinary mindset, which is kind of like just beyond the notes. You're creating content for the sake of content and whatever the topic is. And if it happens to be a particular content type, that's great. And then you have the interdisciplinary where you might be the bridge between those two notes. So it's just kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there's tons of potential. And I just want people to know that I think this is the big thing. And you have your own approach to it. I'm developing my own. And, you know, there's mm -hmm. new, we need to discover by doing these collective conversations, how to solve certain problems so that more people see this as a viable thing versus pigeonholing themselves or putting themselves in a box, which I truly believe is what happens. I think a lot of people, whether they identify this way or not, embodiment's another thing aside from identification. And I think if more people knew that they could successfully market themselves and connect the dots and make a living and make a great living, then they would do it, right? I think they only pigeonhole themselves either because it seems like a lot of work or it's really confusing or a majority of what they see is tells them that you can do that, right? But you're going to really struggle to gain an audience. You're going to really struggle for people to understand what you do. You need to speak to the person like they're a baby. You know, you need mm -hmm. to do all these things. And there's micro truths in those things, but they're not 100% truths. And if you don't have the conviction or the will to be able to know, hey, like, I, I respect all that conventional advice. There's truth in it, right? But hey, this is what I'm doing. Then you're always going to kind of end up in a box, whether it's a box someone else put you in or you built a really nice box to put yourself in. And then 10 years later, you're wishing that you hadn't done that, you know? So I just, yeah. I want more people to understand that that's possible. And so I guess for that to happen, people like you and I need to create solutions that help people do that. Well, and that box is another word for that could be like a view frame. Like you come from that mindset, that one node, that's your view frame. So my node might be multidisciplinary, but since you brought antidisciplinary to my attention, I'm trying to change my view frame to what that would be. So I'm trying to apply the antidisciplinary mindset towards the same, not problems, but just areas that I'm looking at. You know what I mean? Like trying to just change the viewpoint to what that is. Yeah, my true. I think that, and this is one of my goals is or present oriented goals aside from growing my program and more content is to really use the content as a way to build a new theory born out in exp using myself as the experiment, right? Because I'm not going to sell other people on doing something if there's no evidence for it. So just kind of using myself as my own laboratory is like, you know, antidisciplinary, I brought this word from a guy who was using it in an application to the MIT Media Lab and the types of people that they attract and everything. And so I think this guy, Joey Ito, right, he created some foundational level of theory there, right? What I want to do is bring that in and develop a self-development or creative development theory for the individual that begins to not just be a theory, but something that people can start to work with, right? Like we said, like blueprint, but like almost like an anti blueprint, but a way that someone can develop themselves of their own accord without it being like here, like just follow exactly what I did. Cause that's not going to work, but yeah. solutions do need to be there to be able to do that. And I think almost like a new body of knowledge or an evolution of the existing bodies of knowledge with polymathy, Renaissance people, generalism, all of these different little terms and what's so cool about that graphic that you showed me the last time we spoke, it's like bringing all that stuff together so that there's some, some way of understanding the differences or the nuances, but also the connections between these words. And I, I just, I'm really, that's what I've found that I'm the most passionate about that. I think that I can have the greatest impact in that space is like coming up with a new body of knowledge or evolving the existing one into a way where people can start to practice this in their lives and see results. Well, and you're referencing the multidisciplinary spectrum that we talked about last time. And I've shown that on the show in the past and people can look at it too in the description, but it's one of those things where that was something I was passionate about. I loved all these terms. Like I might identify more as polymathic or proto polymath or whatever, but the idea of that particular term being my anchor Someone else might be more anchored towards multidisciplinary or not multi, uh, multi potentialite or something like that. Mm -hmm. And whatever term you use, they all kind of flow, like you mentioned earlier, to that polymath and, and the, as an end goal kind of thing. And I, I started seeing that kind of pattern form, that flow form. And so I created that system, that chart 
of just to show people where that flow goes. And I feel like for you, finding your own, you know, spectrum, if you will, or whatever you're trying to go, like you're architecting people's lives. So how can you can how can you make a system for someone's life architecture kind of thing? Yes. Yes, and I'm working on that right now. Yeah. Yeah. So how could you be an architect of your own life, do you think? I think it's through a mixture of conscious intention, but also this concept that I've been writing about, which is emergence, right? And it's just, Mm -hmm. you know, not everything can be done top down with like intention. Just even the, the most basic example that anyone would understand is if you've ever planned out your day, right, in terms of the actions that you need to take, right? I have a very specific way I do it everyone's got their own way of doing it. Right. But Mm -hmm. you know that you'll plan it out and you know that your day more than likely will never go exactly according to the way that you spelled it out. And I think that you could extrapolate that idea and apply it to your life as a whole and then think about it as like, you can be, make the most conscious decisions and have the greatest intentions and have goals set or whatever. And it's never going to go that way. And so there's this property of emergence that's really there that I think knowing about it is one thing, but really integrating it and it becoming something that you understand that life is your life is going to go according to its own flow, right? And you sometimes are going to be in resistance to it and sometimes you're going to be in flow with it, right? And I think that when you feel like you are in flow with your trajectory is when things are going the best, right? And when you're in resistance to it, it's not. And so on the days when you're in resistance, I think the knowing that it's not a bad thing, but I've put myself here and now I'm running into friction, but friction, that's not a bad, that's not the sign of a bad plan. It's not the sign of a bad architecture. It's just, these are what I need to work with today. Right. And when you're in flow, it's awesome. Right. You're like, man, I'm the most brilliant person in the world. I orchestrated all this stuff and it's just going according to plan. And you can't also identify with that as well, because those days are, are outliers as well. So I think it just comes with conscious intention about your life, who you, who you are most importantly, before yeah. why, who are you? Then why, what is your why, that whole thing? What's the what, what's the how? But most importantly, who are you and are you building in congruence with that? I think that's a really hard question yeah. to answer. It's something that I don't, some days I don't know if I have a, a total grasp on it. And so that's where relaxing and understanding that emergence is also there is that I don't, not everything I'm doing needs to be like, I'm orchestrating the creation of this person that pe- I want people to see. It's just, no, I, I'm becoming what I'm going to become. And as I share things, people are going to naturally develop a perception of me, right? Some people will love me. Some people won't give a shit about me. Sorry, you can edit that out. Uh, <laughs> so, some I people, understand. Yeah, some people will hate me. And so, yeah. but I think the distinction is when we set out to build something like a brand or a business or conscious, it's easy to identify with that as opposed to Mm -hmm. understanding that it's really just a byproduct of me becoming the person that I'm intending to becoming outside of the brand, outside of the business, outside of the image of myself that's being presented, which is really the thing on the surface that people are reacting to, right? But it's not the actual real me. Even right now, I mean, I I believe that I'm being authentic right now, but it's still not 100% authenticity in terms of, you know, a different type of experience with me. So even things like podcasts or when you share your content, you're not your content, right? You're not these surface level things. And I think people struggle when they identify with the image of themselves because they don't know who they actually are. Well, and kind of going back to that flow too, I definitely understand not being where you're wanting to be at. I feel like I'm a year and a half behind on my whole mental trajectory of the whole many years planned. But it's just one of those things where sometimes it's going to be the thing. Sometimes you have more resistance. Like, you know, we talked about COVID earlier. That was a resistance we all felt and it slowed everybody down in some way, shape or form. Accelerated in some ways too. There was a COVID accelerant that I talked to a lot of people about on the show mm-hmm. where if you took advantage of the opportunity of that free time and people being home, you could have done a lot more during that free moment. Mm-hmm. But 
earlier in this episode, we talked, I, I mentioned the whole idea of these like little pulling towards that direction. You have projects pushing you forward and then you're getting pulled towards your goals. But if you don't know what your goal is or if your goal is misaligned where you actually need to be, it's actually a reverse arrow kind of pushing you back. If your projects are behind, you got that project creep or maybe you're just not getting things done as far enough. Again, you're getting pulled back. And so the arrows flip from going forward to going back. But I think going forward is that flow. When both arrows are going forward, that's how you get in the flow. Yes. And I experienced something even that I'm I'm still not really sure about, right? But I'm, I wrote about it, which is sometimes you have to go backwards perceptually to go forwards. And for me, an example of that most recently was when I quit my job last year. Uh, I left the whole life that I've been building in Boston for 10 years. You know, I left people, activities I love. I love Boston itself as a city, right? And I made a conscious choice to move back here where I'm from for a period of time. And part of me is not necessarily like thrilled about that, right? But I lived enough of the life I was living to know that that also wasn't actually getting me where I wanted to go. And in some ways the the comfort or the surface level external stuff like living in a big city having a lot of social opportunities just having more there's just more excitement of course in a city a big city especially when you've been there the thought of going back to maybe a smaller area sounds it really sounds like regression right illinois is just generally not as aesthetically interesting as massachusetts and environment's a really important thing to me right for my own inspiration and creativity but I had gotten to such a point of discontentment with the life that I was living, the, the, the treadmill that I was on, that I realized that the opportunity to come back, but the, to be free and to work on this kind of stuff was actually a massive step forward as opposed to a regression, right? And it's gonna lead me to whatever opportunity comes in the future, whether I do choose to move away or Maybe I choose to just remain, have a base here, and then I go be nomadic and take my business with mm -hmm. me on the road. But I was never going to get to that next step unless I kind of put myself here, which on the surface looks like I'm moving backward in terms of uh, overall like societal status metrics. You know, I took less money. I w went to a less appealing environment, right? Now I'm not in a big right, city. Right. So there's a lot of like things there that you kind of feel the weight of like, I'm, I'm losing status by doing this thing, but I've actually gained a ton of freedom and I feel much more authentic by doing what I've done. I'm only one state away. So I definitely understand. I, yeah, <laughs> I'm right. over in Missouri. So right. I want to move to Austin. So that's kind of like my version of the big city kind of thing instead of Boston. Mm -hmm. And Great city. No rhyme intended. I haven't actually been down there, but for some reason, it's very attached to the idea to move there. So you're definitely preaching to the choir there, and I, I understand the mindset. I feel like I don't want to go back after going there, but you know, the grass is always greener. Uh, so something you mentioned before the call the other day, your goal is to embody both coaching and content with an architecture mindset. How do you plan on doing that? Mm-hmm. Metaphorically, metaphorically, I think it's just using that the root word of architect as my my guide, which is for I think for most people when they hear that word they immediately think building right or they think home or house or some something like that right and I understand that right it's like me having an opinion on law or whatever like I'm I'm just I'm not that's definitely not one of my antidisciplinary nodes is law right so I have a very surface level understanding of it and so I understand that when someone hears architect they think building right but it actually when you look it up it really just means connector of independent systems right. So higher level integration. And that's the way I think about this business that I'm building, the brand, the content and all that stuff. And you're like looking at your systems, it, you, you, I see you as an architect, right? Because you've thought through the level of structure, but also the level of unstructure to it, right? You have a meta frame, right? Like, you know, your Omni blog, right? And then there's all these different things that you're interested in that you can tap into. But because you've provided a superstructure for them to rest in and for that to make sense to someone, it, it gives it order, right? Even though within the order, there's actually a lot of chaos and it's good chaos, right? It's, it's your interests, right? You don't just write about the same subject every single day. You write about a collective of subjects, but 
within that, there's so many different connections that you've drawn um, through you, right? That it makes sense, right? And I think for me, it's the same thing. Like I, I'm right now, a lot of the stuff I'm writing is to provide the foundation of my coaching, but I do envision a point sometime in the future where I'm starting to mix in stuff about actual architecture, like buildings and design projects I've worked on in the past. And maybe the post, I find a way to tie it into the coaching thing. Maybe it's just a post for the sake of posting about architecture or real estate or jujitsu. And I, I want to talk about these things. And I don't care if that doesn't appeal to my base or my demo as I build out an audience, right? It, you know, mm -hmm. I just, I'm not going to be, be one of those people that is, is base oriented. I think people will come to love me because I do what I do and who I think, you are. Yeah. They like the way I express myself and that's why they subscribe. Mm -hmm. Some days they may not care about what I'm posting about and that's okay. Right. But I'm not going to be ruled by my audience and that's the mentality I have. Uh, as an architect is how do I put this together so that I want to wake up and work on this stuff every day. Um, yeah. I think that's important for any individual. I appreciate that analysis and overall just knowing what my brand is about and understanding like the Omni blog, Omni meeting all, like all topics essentially yes. is what I was kind of going yeah. for there. So I appreciate you actually seeing that and acknowledging it. And it's interesting too, to think about, I consider polymathy as my meta niche, right? My umbrella. And then from there, I have my phases, which are essentially just sub niches, if you want to call it that. And I use those words to convey it to people who might come from that background. Like, what is a niche? Well, mm -hmm. it's a simple topic. A sub niche is just the subtopic. And for you, and for you, I feel like architect is your meta niche, it's your umbrella. And that's how you connect things together. So yes. for me, I always anchor things back to polymathy, but yours is architecture. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, I think that I had to almost learn architecture in school. And then that, that's what gave me the next window of insight to come back to the thoughts I was having when I was younger. I was like, well, I did play piano for 13 years and I love doing these other things. I'm also an athlete and mm -hmm. I don't want, I never have wanted to have my life be, this is what I do for work. This is my personal life. And then I have hobbies. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't subscribe to the use of the word hobbies for myself, for other people. And I, I get it. And I also, I understand what the word hobby means. Right. And, but I just, I don't think about that. If I'm going to spend my time doing something while I'm doing it, I'm going to embody the version of myself that hypothetically would be the best at that thing. But I also at the same time know that because of the way I live my life, I'll never be the best at that thing. Right. I think already that I'm the best content creator on the planet. I know objectively that I'm not, right? But it's subjective, right? But that's how I, I operate with it. Like creating content is not a hobby for me. Jiu-jitsu and training is not a hobby for me, you know, or whatever. I just, I don't have hobbies. I have either things I'm either all in on and they, they have some level of facet to the overall vision of my life that I'm building. Some things it's a massive priority. Some things it's small, but they all matter or I don't engage with it at all. You know, that's kind of the way the approach I have. The approach I do on the show is like, they're just areas of interest. So a hobby sure. or a job, it doesn't matter, right? It's just your area of interest. You could be an expert at it or you could be a novice at it. The level of knowledge doesn't really matter, but it's that area. Of, it's an area of knowledge that you have. And so let's explore it. You know what I mean? Even if it's a little bit, we'll explore it for just a little bit. If it's a lot, then we'll explore it a lot of it, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And especially since you said something really important there, if it helps you towards your overarching goal too, right? Yes. That even if it's an interest that's for a short time, it's going to help you in some way. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we don't know when things are going to come back around. And this goes for relationships as well with people, whether they're friendships or, you know, associates, businesses. Uh, it's just, you know, like I, I haven't actually trained jujitsu in a number of months consciously because I'm focused on business right now, because I know that I, when I do it, I get obsessed with it. And that's something Joe Rogan talks about. And I know you, you watch his show, right? And I have that same thing that he talks about with himself. If I get doing something, I become obsessed with it almost to a point where it could be a problem, right? So I haven't actually trained uh, jujitsu in a number of months, but I know that I'm going to hit a certain point with my business and I'm going to start doing it again. And so 
you know, it's like things can come back around. Some things you may do for a very intense period of time and you may learn a series of lessons. You may not come back to it for a number of years, but it doesn't mean that it's still not in your mind. It doesn't mean that right. your knowledge is not still evolving in that subject. It doesn't mean that you're not still learning from the experiences of that, right? And I learned so much in those two years. There was almost, I'm still unpacking lessons that I was I was experiencing and training now, even though I haven't been training. And I think it's going to make me better than when I go back versus I'm not going back yeah. as an extra feed player. You know, that's not how I think about it. You're on that slow burner too in the backlog. Your brain is still processing some of the things that learned before. And one thing that I was going to mention too is the idea of interleaving. It's more of a learning concept. Like you're interleaving right. different topics and going back and forth. But I really like applying that to life as well. When I was a lifeguard, we had different oh, we had different zones in the pool. And we would actually switch between the zones every 30 minutes to help induce that focus. And essentially what they were doing there was interleaving the different zones and helping you switch because at the 30 minutes, your brain just gets a little bit just faded and not focused nearly as well. But you, when you switch zones, you're in a different environment. Even if it's in the same pool, it's still different in angle, different environment, different people, different aspects of the pool. And the same thing happens in life too. You might be interleaving different topics. You could be not touching something for a year or two. You can go back to it. Small little learning curve to get back on track, but for the most part, maybe not even that if you're really good at it. And so it's just interesting how you can switch between them, and that's a safe and normal thing to do. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like uh, or think that interleaving is a way of practice or process that's in direct opposition to time blocking? Do you use it in combination with it, or what are your thoughts oh. as you know those two, the way that those two things intersect? That's a great question, Alex. There was a guest that t talked to me about time blocking a couple of times ago, and it was interesting to think about how it's not necessarily, okay, this time of day I'm doing this thing, this time of day I'm doing this thing. It's more about I need sections throughout the day that I can do my video games for my decompression or doing things for my business or doing things for my learning or self-development. So you have your input and your output times in that day. Then you have the kind of break in the middle or whatever you want to be. And the point of time blocking is to set certain times a day for that. But there's no rule that says it has to be the same time every day. You could even switch between them too. Maybe some days you're more focused on output. Some days you're more focused on input and you might interleave them. I kind of think of it almost in a week scale too. Some mm -hmm. weeks I'm more output focused. Some weeks I'm more input focused. And understanding that, sometimes it's just, it's unconscious for me. I'll just realize it a couple of days into the week, like, oh, I'm not creating very well or very easily but I am really interested in watching these YouTube videos about a certain topic. Okay, I guess I'm more in the learning week this week. And just kind of understanding yourself and your subconscious in a way. Yeah. And using interleaving to channel that. That's super interesting. Because if you're not conscious of it, your mood and your attitude may be, again, if it's conditioned to, I derive like self-worth and pleasure and that experience of love of what I'm doing only when I'm getting the output, right? Which in very strict sense might be a piece of content getting published. It might be sending a certain amount of messages per day if that's your primary vehicle for driving business or whatever these performative actions. But then there are, there are some weeks where it's not going like that. And so if you derive your self-worth from not accomplishing those things or whatever, you need to see, well, what was I doing? If I was doing nothing, right, then maybe that's a bigger problem, right? But if you're doing, like you said, other things, then I guess the next question is like, is it conscious learning or am I avoidance learning, right? And I'm just speaking mm. from a personal, you know, example. There's yeah. been times where, no, I'm, I'm refueling the creative tank here or yeah. there's a reason why I'm getting pulled into this subject that it wasn't immediately clear why, but I know that, oh, that's going to lead to a new output maybe a week from now or something like that. And then there's like, I'm literally, I'm avoiding the thing that I, I should be doing by doing something that I just like doing, which maybe is just learning or whatever. And I don't need to be doing it. So it's just, again, it's all on the individual really to self-diagnose and understand how do I feel about this? Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, or does it need to be good or bad, right? Uh, or just where am I at? And it seems like you have a really good handle on that. But it takes time to develop. Thank you. Well, and 
definitely following the flow too. This morning, I was supposed to make a blog post for my Polymath newsletter. I was supposed to edit an old interview from a week ago or whatever. And instead, I wrote like a 4,000 word blog post about how to be a podcast host because just mm. what I was watching got me sparked on it and I just kept spewing out of me. It's something I've actually wanted to write about for quite some time, but I just never got around to doing it. And the, I was watching an interview with Tim Ferriss and it just got me going with it. And instead of creating what I was supposed to do, plan to do, I created this content, which is a powerful piece that it's going to help somebody down the line. Mm -hmm. What was the... Um... What was the inspiration to do that or what what was like one big takeaway that you really felt mm -hmm. compelled to share from your experience doing this he was talking about vetting like sponsors on the show but then he moved on to the topic of vetting guests like how do you decide who comes on the show and, what, and who doesn't and then what do you do after that process so he was kind of talking about his actual hosting process before the interview during the interview and after and while he didn't talk too much about the after part. He talked about the other two quite a bit. And it was interesting how he was talking about, like, does this person actually bring something to the audience? Like, I've rarely turned people down from the show, but I've done it around a dozen times or so, especially when it's just like a pure businessman wanting to, you know, show their book, right? Okay. That's fine. I'm totally happy giving you a spot to share your book, share your project, share your life. I even have a questions like where can people find you online? What is the call to action? That we'll go through here in a little bit. I have that section there to give you as a business person an opportunity to sell your stuff. I'm happy to do that. But the audience is here for a reason. They're here for to either learn about polymaths that they find interesting or to feel accepted, that kind of thing. And if you're not offering something multidisciplinary to the audience. If you're not wearing many hats, then you're not necessarily a good fit for this show. Go find a more business oriented show or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so vetting your guests is kind of the main point. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Speaking of which, where can people find you online? <laughs> yeah, I'm on uh, mostly on LinkedIn. I think that's the, the thing, but I have, uh, I update my content on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, but yeah, LinkedIn is where I'm, I'm spending most of my time these days. So yeah, just really, feel free to shoot me a, a message or right? that's the best way to connect with, with me right now. I'm not a, I, I have a website up, but I'm really most interested in just getting to know people right now and connecting with different creators and then seeing if there's a fit to work. But honestly, I'm more focused on just meeting people right now and, and establishing relationships. So, yeah. Yeah. I might have someone I need to show you in a second too. And I'll have links in the audience uh, in the description for you. What could be our call to action today? Mm-hmm. I think it's just to, to send me a message, honestly. If you're if you're really yeah. interested in in uh, chopping it up, talking about anything related to creativity, uh, I'll talk about athletics. I'll talk about sports. I'll talk about gamification, tech, like mm -hmm. you name it. That's that's the game. Is just like I'll talk about anything with anyone. But I'm most interested in talking to people that have a a big vision for their life, or they want to create a big vision for their life and seeing if there's any ways that I can help them in that process if they're struggling. That, that's really, really who I'm looking to connect with right now. And definitely next time I'll have to talk about gamification more because we didn't really touch on that at all today, but it's definitely something I'm, I'm interested in too. Yeah. That's a great call to action to message you. What would be a good call to growth for the audience to do? Call to growth. I'll just keep it very, very simple, uh, but I'll frame it in a fun way. If you're not practicing the Wim Hof breathing method on a daily basis. I just think you're le you're leaving growth on the table. Let's put it that way. Mm. It's like, there's so many things I could advocate for people doing, uh, but a lot of it's subjective, but I just truly believe most people don't even know how to breathe correctly. And I was one of them, right? Speaking from experience, but if you have bad allergies, if you struggle with endurance or cardio, or just in general, if you just want to get healthier, just turn on that YouTube video for 10 minutes a day. He literally walks you through it. And the first couple of times you're going to think it's weird or it's not helping or whatever. Just think about like taking a vitamin. Just take a 10 minute vitamin every day. Do that. And I promise you, it, you're going to see massive, massive transformations. They're going to be subtle, especially in the beginning, but just do it. And you, you're going to level up beyond what you think, right? It's just, it's amazing what it, what it will do for you. I did the Wim Hof method with some aqua meditation and it was really interesting how I was able to hold my breath for over 90 seconds because of it. And it was just super exciting. 
Yeah. So once again, oh, yep. sorry. No, no, it's it's all, it's all good. I was just gonna say that I think it's also what you learn when you hold your breath is that stillness is the main component to it, and you'll find how unstill you are when you first start doing it or any form of meditation. And I think that gives you a great roadmap to be able to see how can I improve from this, right? It makes you a better podcast. Host. I, I realized the first few calls I did, right? A lot of my, I'm a very fidgety person or whatever, but you know, you need to learn how to be able to be still and also just be calm, right? And that's a good way to do it. I definitely had to work on active listening when I first started to, even now, today even. So once again, this is Dustin Miller, Polymavitter, and Alex Weber on the Polymath Polycast. Thanks for joining. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's been awesome. Innovators crave innovative products, which is exactly why the Polymath Polycast is powered by Riverside.fm. With Riverside, you can achieve studio quality without the need for an actual studio. You'll get uncompressed audio and up to 4K video from the comfort of your own home. All recordings are done locally, which means that you and your guests will get the highest quality possible, even with unreliable internet. Hi, I'm Kendall from Riverside, and do yourself a favor and upgrade from cloud-based softwares like Skype, Zoom, or Hangouts. Try out Riverside today and use the link in the show notes because your groundbreaking content deserves to look and sound its very best. (laughs) 